All right, folks. I'm very, very pleased to welcome to the program a good friend and one of my musical heroes, guitar player extraordinaire, Billy Crane. Billy, thanks for doing this, buddy. Appreciate it. I wanted to uh, start out just to get your feelings on the whole situation of the world in 2020 would have never dreamed it would be like this is sort of a madhouse uh not just the covid but the way people are acting and all like that i want to get your thoughts on it and also uh address your thoughts on the fact that musicians are also suffering because they're not able to get out and play and people are suffering because <laughs> They're not getting live music, and we need that as bad as we need any, about anything, you know? So your thoughts? You know, I, I'm not a very political person, but I am concerned uh, about the music industry because people seem to forget. I know it starts all the way at the top, you know, with, with the Keith Urbans and the Bruce Springsteen's, you know, it affects them, but then it, that filter you've got their band, their road crew, their drivers, back to all, all the theaters they're playing, to the union people. All these people do not have income now. And you're talking millions of people. And uh, and we've been writing letters to our congresswoman over here, Marsha Blackman. She's been trying to, to do something about helping uh, those. Uh, I, I even saw where uh, uh, Delbert McClinton, they'd set up a GoFundMe for him. Uh, it's, I was like, man, this is really bad times right now. But it's, it's, you know, we, the music industry was the first thing they closed down, and it's probably going to be the last thing that they open up. I'm here maybe in the middle of 2021. Uh, but it could, it might be 2022. I, we just don't know. Well, so hope, hopefully we'll all live that long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's very true. You know, I, I got to thinking, you know, about my brother and Charlie, God brought them home. So they didn't have to, to put up with this stuff anymore. People are going nuts out there. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, spoken to Charlie Daniels the Friday before he passed. And uh, he had he had said something so funny to me. He was talking about, um, and I'm not political either, okay? I'll just say that. But he was talking about the whole movement to get rid of all the Confederate statues and all that kind of stuff. And J Charlie said, I don't know what they're going to do about those pesky Dixie cups. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you, he mentioned it, that probably good is what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know, it was crazy. Well, let's go all the way back, back to the dawn of time. Back, <laughs> Well, not that far. Let's go back to uh, when you were younger and uh, the um, – how did you first become interested in music? And also tell me how your brother Tommy played into that and when you started playing guitar, that type of thing. My – mom and dad <clears throat> my mom was a, a trained pianist and my dad was a tinker though he could put, he could play jazz he could play brubeck and some of that stuff <clears throat> and they always had music on around the house we always had a radio on and i remember right around about right around the 60s when chubby checker came out and that that whole uh, <clears throat> soulful uh, movement that, that came out around that time. We, we were just eating that up. And uh, Tommy and I were always fighting over the radio to see what station we were playing. We had WMAK in Nashville, and they started playing all the early, what you would say, rock and roll and, and uh, soul stuff. And Tommy, he got a guitar f f first. He was, I think he was 10. He, uh, he got a little acoustic guitar and was playing it. And, uh, and I... I wanted to be like my brother, love my big brother. And, uh, so he, I, one day when he wasn't there, I got his, his guitar out, was playing and playing, and I busted a string on it and freaked out. I, I didn't know you could change strings. I thought I broke his guitar. So I put it on, 
over in his room and I hid under my mom and dad's bed for three hours. And finally Tommy peeked under and said, you can come out now, Billy, I have an extra string. And <laughs> so at that point, you know, he started showing me just simple chords like E minor and A minor, playing them back and forth and learning how to strum. And uh, he, around fifth grade, he started doing the, uh, the whole band thing when the Beatles hit, especially. Uh, he was getting in the band and I had little bands and stuff. That, and uh, as we got to high school, when the Almond Brothers band came out, he said, man, Billy, listen to this. And I was just floored. And uh, we started playing together at that point. And uh, I was in high school and he was senior in high school then. And it, it, that's, it just took off from there. Well, how did you guys uh, come to put together the uh, Flat Creek Band? I have a great memento. Roger Campbell, you know, who was Tommy's and my oh, original Roger, yeah. guitar tech and worked for Charlie all these years, Yeah, gave me this. Uh, oh, is it, it's backwards. That's <laughs> right. I had to turn around. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you see it? Can you read it? Yeah, I can read it clearly, yes. This. Well, Craig, a, a one dollar. This was in 1972, <laughs> and a friend of mine ours down the street had a great big field in his backyard and we had a open field concert out there. We would do, do that with Flat Creek. We'd just go to somebody's house and set up and play. And we started Flat Creek modeled on the Almond Brothers band, Tommy and I, and I had both seen the, uh, the Almond Joys quite a few times. And then we saw the Almonds when Blaine was in the band with them a, a whole lot. And that we want to be like those guys. Love the music. It was so real. And uh, so we started out. We learned um, Hot Lana six months before it came out. Hmm. We, because we were in, we were playing down in our, on vacation down at Fort Lauderdale. And we got to go see the Almonds three nights in a row down there. And we, both of us playing by ear, we picked the whole thing out. Went home, worked it up with the band, and we were already playing it before it oh. come out. It was so cool. <laughs> wow. I'm sure that was, are there any types of flat Greek around? Yeah, there, there's, there's a site in Nashville. I, I think it's on a, if you go on and look at flat Creek band on a, on the internet, you can, you can buy a CD, but we've got, there's some, uh, uh quite a bit of studio recording and uh, there, I think there's an early version of We Got Tennessee on there and there's an early version of Franklin Limestone, you know, which Tommy took with him, a uh, Charlie Daniels fan. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I got, a, I, got a, I got a good story. Speaking of Roger, you'll like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, somebody had written in Nashville online, uh, what, what was your first studio experience? Ours was in 1971. It was a Flat Creek band. Roger worked for us, Mule worked for us, who was Charlie's sound guy for Michael Sanderson for years. We went to do a session over to Audio Media, uh, or no, Creative Workshops over in Nashville. And uh, Buzz Case was nice enough to let us cut some sides. Well, we had a great time, get some tapes, and we left. But we, when we left, we took all his microphones. <laughs> and he called Tommy up, <laughs> he said, Tommy, he said, will you please have Roger bring my microphones back? So Roger had to take all his microphones back that, that he'd taken from the studio. That was our first studio experience. <laughs> well, uh, tell me a little bit about how you uh, first uh, hooked up with Henry Paul, Henry Paul Band. Um, Tommy and I in 1973, 72 or 73, were playing up in the a club of Friday's Child in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, the strip back then was really on fire. A lot of bands coming through and playing. We were up there playing on a Sunday night and somebody called uh, Jim Bradley, he was the owner, uh, and it said, hey, I'm the manager of the Outlaws. Can they come down and, and they're playing here somewhere tomorrow night. Can they come down and do a set? And they asked us, we said, sure. We, we didn't even have any clue who they were. And uh, they came down and 
and sat and did a whole set on our old ragged equipment that we had. I, I think I was playing through a Marshall 50 watt bass head at that time. And, and uh, they were great. And uh, I, I didn't, I met most of everybody. I got to know Billy Jones really well. So over the years, the Outlaws, you know, when Tommy joined Charlie, Outlaws did lots of dates with the, with the uh, Charlie Daniels band. And I got to, to hang out with a bunch of them. Uh, it's kind of funny. I always thought Henry was kind of arrogant, so I didn't really talk to him uh, a whole lot. But when he left the Outlaws, I was with Bobby Whitlock, man, and he it was kept calling where I was staying and leaving messages. Uh, and I never would call him back because I, I just was like, I'm playing with Bobby. I don't want to leave this. Finally, he called my mother. <laughs> And my mother called me in Memphis. She said, Billy, you need to call Henry Paul right now. He's got a record deal, and he needs you to come play in his band. I went, oh, I guess I better call him. <laughs> I called him up, and two months later, I was, I was headed down to Tampa, Florida to put together his new band. Wow. Yeah, and you did. Uh, you guys, how many albums did you do with a Henry Paul band? We did four. Yeah. We did Grey Ghost, uh, Feel the Heat, uh, Anytime, and then the Blue album was just Henry on the front. And uh, uh, it was a great band. I, I think personally one mistake we made uh, was when, when uh, we parted with Jim Fish because the band went off more commercial direction than the southern rock that we were doing, and, and it, it hurt us. Yeah. 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 The um my train of thought just got derailed. Sorry about that. The uh, <laughs> That happens to it us at this age. It happens when I get a little older than I used to be. Um uh, well I was just gonna say, yeah, so many great things with Henry Paul Ben and Grey Ghost is in my top albums of all time. I I just love that album and um I wanted to ask about how you segued from Henry Paul band into playing with the Bellamy brothers. Well, uh, see, I was living in Pasco County, Florida, where the Bellamy's were living and uh, Wally Dance's roommate, you know, Wally from the, from the Henry Paul band, uh, John, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm see, I'm losing. I'm at a blank spot too. Yeah. Um, I can't remember John's last name, and I know him so well. Uh, he was a sound man tech for the Bellamy Brothers in the Henry Paul Band. We were at the end of the line. We had, you know, lost our management company and everything and weren't on salary anymore, and dates were getting get far and few between. And uh, John DeRussi, there we go. Uh, John DeRussi asked Wally, he said, uh, would you guys want to come and audition for the Bellamy Brothers? They're thinking about changing and going a little bit more progressive. And we said, sure. And let's see, that was in December of 82. So we left Henry uh, and went and rehearsed in January of 83 and went out on the road with the uh, Bellamy Brothers. Went out for six months straight. I thought I was touring hard before. Woo! <laughs> But they were they were great guys. It it was different for me because you know you you're talking about country crowd and you know it not being as rowdy as being a Henry Paul band con concert. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. they but, but it, I I was making more money and my brother at the time <laughs> he wasn't happy about that. What was it about? What year was that? Do you remember? Uh, nineteen eighty three. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was long afterward. Okay. I was trying to think of, uh, back in high school when the Bellamy brothers first came out and they had let your love flow as a single. And I was a radio announcer, a radio DJ. I remember playing that record all the time. And I was trying to think of in my mind, you know, when you get as old as I am, you, you, you know, decades blend together, not just years, but decades. I'm like, wait a minute. That was the seventies. Billy couldn't have been on that record. No. Okay. No, he, it, that was been the It was late seventies. Uh, yeah. And they'd been tour you know, after they had that big hit, they, they went the more country direction and, and, uh, 
so yeah, they, they well, they're still, you know, doing very well. And then uh, one of them's, or both of them's sons, when Elf, I remember uh, talking to them when I first started the Kudzu Radio Hour, I had an interview with a couple of the Bellamy sons, and they were making music. <laughs> Yeah, Jesse, cool. Jesse and Noah. Jesse and Noah. Yeah, Bellamy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Very, guys. very good guys. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, well, uh, was gonna. One thing I, you know, is so weird that I thought I knew you. I guess I didn't know you at all. I was researching this morning, and I came across a thing about your songwriting. I had no earthly idea that you had had cuts by Dixie Chicks and Poco, and Martina McBride, and all that. So, I mean, you've been writing quite a few songs. Tell me a little bit about your songwriting, some of the some of the things that you've, uh, songs that you've had recorded. There, there's the wall back there. Uh-huh. My wife made me take him out of the house and put him in the studio, so she said, is, you know. Is one of them a Dixie Chicks record? There is one. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> Why don't spaces? It's at eleven million. It actually is somewhere in thirteen million now. I'm sorry to call them the Dixie Chicks. I meant to say the Chicks. No, call them the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> well, that's who they are. And <laughs> named after I the know. named after the Lowell George song. For goodness sakes. I know. It, Please it, don't take that song away. That's one of my favorite no songs. No kidding, man. What, <laughs> what Lowell George was. I love I the know. feet. You know, I I wrote. Uh, then Tommy and I had Flat Creek Band. I wrote some of the songs for you. just when I first started writing. And then when I got with Henry Paul Band, Henry wanted us to all join him in, in writing. And I was kind of a, a step ahead of some of the others musically. So, and Henry was really uh, lyrically inclined. He, he, he had a lot of musical influence too. So I got, got to write a lot of the material on those four records. And then with the Bellamy's, um, I continued to write, and uh, finally I wrote wrote a song by myself and and played it for Wally. And Wally took it to David Bellamy, and David said, "Why don't you make some changes on it?" And and he did, and and in, it was 1988. It came out. It's called "I'll Give You All My Love Tonight." It was it's their last top five hit, as a matter of fact, they had. And so. Um, you know, I was like, wow, you can make money writing songs. This is the first time ever. <laughs> and so I decided to move back to Nashville and become a songwriter. And I got a publishing deal. And I was in a band with a guy named Ronnie Gilbo and uh, uh, Rick Lano was playing drums. And uh, I can't remember, uh, Stick Davis from the Amazing Rhythm Maces was playing bass. And we had a band uh, called Gilbo. And uh, we wrote this song "Call It Love" for our for our band, and we were getting some label interest, and had a had a A and R guy come in from uh, L A. and come see the band, and he he told her manager, he said, "Well, I don't see anything in the band, but I would love this song for my act Poco." And Ron Gilbo did not want to give it up; he wanted to to hold on to it for the band, and and I saw the band was it was headed towards time, and I I, I told him I said, "All right." Uh, you're not going to let them cut it. I'm not going to let you cut it either. So he said, okay, fine. So uh, Poco cut this song and it it went to number two in America and number one uh, in a lot of places around the world. Now here's the, the kicker on this was Jim and Cena went behind our backs and rewrote the second verse oh. and didn't tell anybody. And so when it came out, it was a four-way split, and it wasn't. We never gave them permission to do that, and they finally worked it out somehow in court. But but some money was lost that way. Mm. And then after that, I started writing for a a, a, a country uh, publisher on Music Row, and and uh, and got hooked up with Paul Worley, who was you know produced the Dixie Chicks and Martina McBride, and and all the just tons of acts and started writing for him and, and so um, got got a lot of cuts that way that's that's how i met the dixie chicks i didn't know who they were i was but who's the dixie chicks and they ended up cutting a song letter rip of mine on their first album 
and I played on that album and I actually did their radio tour with them. Oh, there's those are some hard drinking ladies right there. No doubt. <laughs> Especially Natalie. Um, yeah, yeah, was, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> yeah. She's son. She's a piece of work, man. I, I like them. I like, I still like them. And, uh, the, um, even though it's not cool to like, you know, uh, that's another thing. I wrote a column about the other day called, I like what I like because people like a lot of people give me, you know, you're the ambassador of Southern rock. You mean you like the Dixie chicks? Well, yeah. And you like Taylor Swift? Well, yeah, uh, some of it, not all of it, but I like some of it. I like some of about everything almost. So, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, I just, I can't stand music snobs, you know, that just, Oh, you mean you listen to kiss? Ooh, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, I listen to a lot of stuff, man. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Another thing I learned about you that I wasn't quite aware of was that you'd play guitar on a lot of really cool records too. Uh, you played what on a Shania Twain? recording yeah yeah uh, that that's your second or sophomore album the one where mutt lang came in and that just exploded uh i played on a song called if you're not in it for love i'm out of here yeah you, they, they recorded here in town and they wanted a slide player and uh they called me to come in and i i went down there with my marshall i mean i went marshall with, with a box uh ac30 and a slide guitar and and uh What's his name? I can't remember. Uh, Franklin, a really good steel player in town, was doing a solo for me. And I had to watch him do this solo over and over again because Mutt's famous, you know, for being so particular about pulling one little bitty note here and there. And I thought I was doomed. But he had got me in there and loved everything I was playing, so we got, got in and out pretty quick. But they were both really, really nice people. Oh, well, that's cool. That's cool. The, um, of course, in 2008, I got all excited when you uh, rejoined with Henry and the Outlaws. And uh, I maintain that uh, the lineup with you in it was perhaps uh, one of my, uh, you know, I, I, would get, I would get really slapped in the face by the Outlaws fans where I say it was my favorite lineup, but other than the original lineup, I think it was my second favorite. And uh, I mean to tell you, it was great live. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and, and it just lasted for a little while. And, of course, you did the incredible uh, It's About Pride album, which is fantastic. Um, a few thoughts on playing with the Outlaws and also wrap it up by telling us why in the world you left. Oh, I I love playing with the Outlaws. Uh, Henry called me originally in 2005, the first time they were putting it together with Huey. And at the time, I was uh, writing songs and, and doing pretty well and, and was pretty tied up. And I, I said, no, nah, Henry, I can't do it. And this time around 2008, after Huey had passed away uh, and, the, and the whole songwriting industry was starting to kind of collapse you know with a swing of radio Henry called me and asked would you be interested in, in stepping in uh, where Huey was and I, you know I said I, I'm not another Huey Thompson there's only one Huey but I'll try my best and I came into the band and, and just had a blast it was a great band everybody got along really well and uh, it was powerful when, when we were all on the same page, it, it was one of the best bands that I'd ever been in. And uh, loved working with them. You know, after Tommy died in 2011, um, things started going kind of haywire for me. Tommy died, Sandy got cancer, breast cancer, and almost passed away. Uh, we were in that terrible lawsuit with uh, Mary Thomason it ended up costing the band $375,000 in, in lawyer's fees. We didn't get Christmas bonuses anymore. Our pay was cut in half. Um, it, it just seemed like one thing after another. Uh, oh, I got, we got Dallas and Stella, our, our foster children. 
then, uh, and then in 2013, uh, my mom and my dad both passed away within a month of mm. each other, and it, cool. it was too much. It was too much for me to handle. Mm. Um, I, I couldn't. I was collapsing. I remember I was down about 129 pounds, and everybody was around me was wondering when's he gonna die. You know, it's gonna be any day now. And um, finally, my I have a Christian psychiatrist see and my pastor at my church. I saw them both the same day, and they both told me the same thing. You have to get off the road right now. And I'm going, no, 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 we have dates. I'm getting on the bus tonight. And Father Ray said, no, this is God's will for you. He's trying to save your life. You call him right now and tell him you won't be there. So I had to call him and tell him, which, you know, I felt terrible doing that. Uh, but that's when Steve Grisha got to come back in. So it, yeah. it, it was a good thing. So I got back and I got healthy and got my, got my, you know, back, back into living. It was all the stuff that had been going on and trying to tour was just tearing me to pieces. And I was just wore out. Those guys, they work hard. Yeah, sure do. I tell you what, I, uh, I love all those guys, Randy and, and all of them. And, um, and Henry has just been gold to me. Oh um, yeah. He just, he treats me like gold. He's been so, he calls me Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody calls me Mikey except my niece. Could be worse. Yeah. Could be worse. He could call you Buffy. Buffy. Well, a lot of people do, and it just makes me pig biting mad, but that's okay. No, I won't do that I'm, again. No, I'm just kidding. I don't really ever get mad about anything, Harley. Um, You're all pretty low key. Yeah, it's just the way it goes, you know. It's like it's a good parenting, I believe, a good, good upbringing, good Christian upbringing. Um, so I was going to say, um, the, um, so about 10 years ago is when you started your string of solo albums, the unending solo albums of Billy Crane, <laughs> like one every week. Uh, there's like, and I, I've written so many reviews and, and enjoyed every one of them. But the thing, the common denominator of these albums is, your mixture of Southern rock songs and what I would call contemporary Christian songs. And I wanted to ask you what inspires you to put together this type, these types of albums. I mean, I know probably what the overall answer is, uh, the man, but, uh, yes. but, uh, tell me a little bit about that. Feel free to, uh, Feel free to preach whatever you want to do. <laughs> I'll preach, by God. You know, I, I, for years, I was a slave to drugs and alcohol. And uh, all those years with Henry Paul and the Bellamy's, I had terrible drug problems. Uh, and uh, and it, 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 was, it was killing me. It started killing me way back then. And then in, when I moved back to Nashville, uh, 1992, I got saved. Again, I grew up in church and, and came back to church and uh, and started this relationship with Jesus Christ that continues to this day. And so that was one of the factors that kept me going on the road. I would get up an hour before everybody else did in the morning and pray and read my Bible and, you know, try to keep some normalcy in that. And it carried over into my music. I, I didn't want to write full-blown contemporary Christian music, you know, praise and worship. Uh, I, I, I wanted to write, let's see, Hellfire and, and Wrath music. <laughs> no. uh, I, I would write these uh, these songs, and they would be on the edge. They, you know, it'd be, I talk about Jesus a lot, talk about God. And, uh, but then there's the other side of me that Henry, Henry always called me uh, the social commentator of the songwriter world. And, and I love to write about different subjects and things and, and just kind of, of gel them together. Yeah. I got, I'm, I'm trying to get, finish up my new one so I can start another one. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good thing about it is, uh, you, even during the, uh, even during what I, I keep calling it the plague <laughs> during this uh, lockdown thing, at least you're able to record. That's one, that's one good thing. Yeah. Uh, can't get that out and play. Good. But, you know, unless you play, I've seen so many people play uh, from their living room on the computer, you know, uh, that's been one thing that 
if there's a positive from all this, it, it's that uh, I felt a real connection with some pretty famous rock and rollers uh, that I would see, you know, just stripped down and playing acoustic guitar and singing on the computer. And a lot of the girls wouldn't even, you know, be all made up or anything. Like, uh, I like watching the ones that Kelly Clarkson post, you know, she, she looks like she just got up out of bed, you know, and she's up there singing and it sounds just as, <laughs> it sounds as wonderful as ever. And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of like that seeing people for who they really are. And, uh, you know, and I've seen so many shows where, you know, like you're talking about Delbert, it's like that with, uh, guys, I can't think right now, but some of the more popular people would do like a thing and just put a PayPal thing up where you can tip them during the show. Right. They're, right. You know, it's like, uh, one of my friends that's a pretty famous musician. I won't call his name, but it, he said, people think that I'm rich. No, uh, uh. No, without the gigs and all, you know, I'm just like everybody else. He said, I'm just, uh, you know, I haven't got any money coming in, you know, so it's like uh, everybody, a lot of people are in the same boat, you Absolutely. know, so, you know and, and, and Absolutely. all we can do is just pray, pray, pray that all this uh, works itself out. But I was going to say, I just had a couple more things. One thing I had to just had to, ask you about on the video is uh of course going back nine years ago to 2011 your big brother tommy it was such a shocker when we lost him uh for all of us but especially for you i'm sure i wanted to ask you your um okay two things your greatest memory of tommy and also what's the best thing that you ever learned from him my greatest memory with Tommy, uh, everything, <laughs> every, everything with him was fun, man. He was, he was just the coolest brother. What, what older brother of a high school kid or an eighth or seventh grader wants to hang out with their little brother? I don't know too many. And he took me under his wing. He taught me out how to play uh, and later on when he was Charlie he taught me how to be a human being in the rock and roll world you know Tommy was nice and loved everybody he loved you so much Michael he, he ta always talked about you and, and the things that y'all did together yeah. and that rubbed off on me that uh, you know he taught me how to t treat others and and that's why you know people people come to my Facebook page um, and, and make a comment go, hey, you know, we, we write on other people's in the music business page and they never answer back. And, and I try to answer everybody that, that sends me a message. It's, it, it's, it gets hard sometimes. Uh, yeah. With this COVID, it's been harder. But, and that, that comes from Tommy it, about treating all people equal, you know. Tommy was a working man's working man. He was just an incredible musician and husband and wife, you know? Man. Yeah, I fully agree. Thank you for saying that about him caring for me because the feeling was mutual. He knew that. And what's so bizarre is that I, there were two guys in the Southern rock world that I talked to almost weekly, Tommy Crane and Jackson Spires. Um, would talk to those guys almost weekly and it's hard to believe that they've gone on to a better place now, but it's, uh, you really miss these guys, <laughs> you know, oh, I miss, I miss Tommy's. Oh man. What a country boy. Hey, he's from, the belly, he walked, belly. from the way he walked the way Michael, Michael, he said, the way he said my name, everything. I just, man, I miss him. But uh, speaking of uh, all that, I, I was going to ask you about the project you did not so long ago with Charlie Daniels called The Bow Wheels. What a great album that was. Uh, did you guys uh, ever get to go out and play any gigs as The Bow Weevils? We did one in Nashville, uh, and it, it's, it's on YouTube. 
if you oh. want want to watch it. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We did one uh, a t uh, we filmed uh, with video and everything. We did a set uh, back. My wife, that was right when my wife had fallen and hit her head and was really ill. And uh, we didn't do anything. We we actually talked to Charlie a few months ago about this upcoming volunteer jam about having the bow weevils come out and play. Oh, but yeah. um, that was the coolest, probably the cool, one of the coolest things I've done musically. And how it came about was, was Charlie had been out in Colorado. He's got that place he goes to in the winter and he started writing these songs and he comes back here and he gets with Charlie Hayward and James Stroud, a famous uh, session drummer here and cuts these three sides and he goes, Roger, I need some slide guitar on this. I want you to find out what kind of strings uh, Dwayne Allman uh, used and, and what size and what kind of bottle, how did he tune it? So Roger <laughs> called your friend down there at the, at the museum and yeah. got the whole thing up and he's doing, getting, he's got the guitar strung up the way like Dwayne did and everything, same model. And finally Roger looked at him and he said, hey, Charlie, why don't you just call Billy Bill and get him to come over and play slide? And Charlie said, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> so I came over and played on the two songs they cut. And Charlie said, man, you want to be part of the band? I was like, duh. <laughs> it was so cool. And you, you, you know what, I, what was the coolest thing about it was that night we played live, I got to feel what my brother felt standing next to Charlie. Yeah. It was, it was like, there were angels in the room. TC was right there. And, and I told Charlie, I said, Charlie, I mean, I was in tears. I said, thank you for letting me. I, I got to feel what Tommy felt every night on that stage playing with you. Yeah. Because he just, you know, man, he just oozes just everything great. Yeah. I mean, there were so many years, you know, I was going every year for the longest time to the Angelus thing that Charlie did down in, in yeah. Florida. And Tommy would be there, and uh, inevitably Tommy would invite me over to play in, at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. We would jam with um, Charlie Daniels and uh, whatever, you know, maybe some of the Crosstown All Stars, or maybe some of the Trick Pony band, or some of those. But playing between, you know, standing up on the same stage, and it was usually me and the cartoonist guy Gilchrist and we were up there singing <laughs> we were all it guy was a great guy's a great guy and yeah, we were standing yeah. we were standing there um with Charlie and Tommy and and the feeling like you said I don't know I never had such a energetic feeling in my life and I would watch Charlie like one time at the grand finale of the outdoor show I went out there to do uh to, to play on uh, or to sing on Devil Went Down to Georgia and all that. And Charlie had like all the guitar players lined up and he had his fiddle bow and he was like, he was like a conductor, man. He would point to one guy and he would play and then he'd point to another one. And I mean to tell you, I had never seen anybody have that much control over 28 musicians <laughs> in my life. But see, that's, that's what a miracle. I, I know that's what I meant. The greatest thing I miss about Charlie was his, um, you know, the reason I write about Southern rock and the reason I think so much about Southern rock is the volunteer jams and that Don Kirshner's rock concert from 1973 in Macon, Georgia. The, oh, yeah. <laughs> those two things got me started on that whole deal and I'll never forget it. Okay. My last question. Well, my next to the last question, my next to the last question is just briefly your thoughts on Charlie Daniels. I think Charlie Daniels was one of the greatest ambassadors for Southern Rock that we could ever have. Um, when, Char when Henry called me and told that Charlie died that morning, it's like a whole era was gone to me, you know, with Tommy, and Charlie, and Taz, and uh, Dwayne, and Gray. I mean, all these people, the ones that I grew up, I, you know, loving, and, and, and that were there were all disappearing. And um, 
Charlie was always treated me like family. He'd have me come out and play. He'd let me ride on the bus with him. And uh, now he didn't. When he when he 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 instilled the you're wired, you're fired rules. You didn't screw up anymore after that. So we, <laughs> <laughs> Tommy and I had to do a lot of hiding out, but he was always and even after Tommy left the band, you know, he's I would talk to him every once in a while. And then last year when I had cancer, uh, he had gone through the same experience and he he was the one that got me into Vanderbilt Hospital pretty quickly and because it was progressing pretty quickly and uh, mm. and walked me through that whole thing and, and continued to call me every month to see how I was doing. <laughs> and then, then the Bo Weevil things happened and we would talk a couple of times. Uh, that Sunday night before he died, I, I meant to call him and I got involved with something else and I didn't make that phone call. Mm. Uh, but he's, what a great man. I, I don't, you know, what can you say about it? Hey, yeah, stop that, stop that. that. That's true. What a beautiful tune that was. The uh, <laughs> It won't quit either. Yeah. I, I got it turned off. Oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Last question. Quit. Last question. Future plans for you, Billy Crane. What you got planned? Oh, me, oh, my. Uh, you know what? We're, I think Charlie Hayward and I are going to do something. I uh, want to, I want sure. I love Charlie Hayward. We've been too. buddies for forever, and he's just the kindest, gentlest man. And what a bass player! He's Solid just a man. And on the Bo Weevil's record, we went in there. We we would cut it one time, and it was done. You know, it, rarely we would overdub maybe a solo, but it, it was amazing. But I wanted to do a next uh, record called called uh, Strip Down. And I want to do it just like bass, guitar, drums. You know me, I usually use keyboards and all kinds of stuff. And, oh, yeah. And kind, and kind of carry on with it, where the bow weevils work. Make it a little more swampy and stuff. And that's that's what I'm thinking about. Hopefully doing. My but I'll keep on making solo records. It, it, it Playing music keeps me sane. If I go too Ooh. long without playing, I go nuts. I know, me too. I know, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly what you mean. Well, um, all right. Well, cool. I tell you, man, I appreciate your time and everything. I know people are going to love to, uh, hear from you again. And, uh, I'm glad everything's going well with you. And I'm, I guess you're, uh, you're past the cancer all the way now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just yeah. had my yearly checkup and I, I'm still, Point zero one, which is uh, undetectable. So, uh, you know, praise God for that. Yeah, stay away from the COVID and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all uh, and uh, you know all that. But thanks, buddy. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. I uh, thank you so much for doing this. All right, thank you for having me, Michael. I love you, man, and and uh, I'm so grateful that you're still being an ambassador for Southern rock, man, you're, you're holding us all together. Well, it's, uh, I appreciate it. I'm trying, I'm trying. Thanks. <laughs>